Before we get into our podcast with Jason Hart, I want to remind you guys about DraftKings. The 2021 basketball season is here. The teams around the league took the offseason to retool and revamp and are ready to hit the court. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, has rolled out another one of their can't-miss offers. Trying DraftKings Sportsbooks is easy, so what are you waiting for? Get in on all of the action now. To celebrate the return of basketball, DraftKings Sportsbooks is giving new players 100 to 1 odds on any featured matchup this week. That's right. All you have to do is bet $1 on any featured matchup this week, and if your team wins, you cash a crisp $100. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbooks app now and use promo code FIELD68. When you sign up to get 100 to 1 odds on any featured matchup this week, that's code FIELD68 for new players to get a shot at $100 on any featured matchup this week for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbooks. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbooks for detail. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Now let's get to our conversation with Jay Hart. What's going on, everyone? This is Eric Devendorf, your host of the Scores Table Podcast. Today we got another orange legend on from L.A., 10-year NBA career, Syracuse All-Century team, school's leader in steals, up there in points and assists, uh, the one and only Jason Hart. Coach Jason Hart, because I'm going to call you Coach. I, well, I can get away with calling him Jay Hart, but that's yeah. me. But everybody else, Coach Jason Hart. What's going on, Jay? Hey, man, ain't nothing, man. Just uh, uh, appreciate you bringing me on, man. And I want to tell you, uh, proud of all the work you're doing in, in uh, Central New York area, man. And for you bringing us on just to kind of um, talk Syracuse basketball, former players, man, it's an honor for me, for sure, bro, for sure. Oh, man, I appreciate you, man. That means a lot. It, it's been cool, like, uh, you know, kind of talking to guys and – sharing like stories off the court like a lot of fans wouldn't know about these stories that we sharing you know inside the locker room and everything like that so no it's been cool man but uh let's start you being from LA man what brought you all the way out to the Q's man you 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 supposed to be at UCLA or or USC you know especially back then UCLA what what brought you all the way to uh, Central New York so um I would I wouldn't I was a late bloomer nationally not locally so I, you know, going from my junior to my senior year, I got invited to the ABCD Adidas camp, uh, okay. Sunday girls camp. And um, I had a good camp. That was my first time me being on the national. And Hop was there, seeing me. And um, once they offered me a scholarship, I took it. I, it wasn't like a, like, let me wait and see. I said, I'm going. So um, although I did want to go to UCLA, a friend of mine had already committed when we was a sophomores. And so I could, that was out. And then USC hadn't reached that level of consistency yet. And I, and Syracuse was a no brainer. You know, I had some other schools, but you know, Syracuse was a no brainer. Lazar Sims was leaving as a starting point guard. And Coach Bayheim said, I can, I can get the ball as a freshman. So I said, hey, let's do it. So, I mean, I mean, you knew about the weather change. You knew about, you know, going from sunny LA 75 every day to, Man, you coming to four feet of snow, you know what I mean? Negative, negative, negative degree weather. So that didn't have any impact on your choice coming to Q's? Like you just, it was straight, it was straight ball. Well, I, you know, on my official visit, man, that was my first time ever seeing snow. You know what I mean? <laughs> so that, that was my first time ever seeing snow. It was just an opportunity to play, man. I'd always been watching the Big East on big, uh, big Mondays, big Mondays, and watching Allen Iverson, and, you know, John Wallace and all these guys, Kerry Kittles in the Big East. And I said, damn, I'm I want to do something like that. And when the opportunity afforded itself, I came. And then Bayheim always told me, because I asked him about the, how cold it was. He was like, well, we keep the dome at 72. So I was like, well, there it is. The dome's at 72. That's my weather. That's my weather on every day in LA. So I'm in the dome. So I, I, I ran with that. And you know, the dome was always feeling good, you know, firsthand. So that's what it was. Yeah, already. So how much did Hop have an influence? I just know, because I know how crazy Hop is, like as far as his energy and, and especially like when he's recruiting, I've seen him, I've seen how, you know, his style is like, was he like that recruiting you when, when you're, you know, coming to Q's? So you got to think when I was um, in 95, Hop wasn't, he wasn't on staff just yet in the summertime. He got put on staff That's maybe it, that right. fall of 95. So right. I had been knowing him 
prior to because he and I played for the same AAU coach. Okay. So when Hop actually seen me, Beheim and them hadn't seen me yet. He probably told them about him because he was just at the camp working the camp as trying to get in, trying to break into the business. Right. So um, the recruiting, uh, it was Hop, but it really was Bernie. And so um, – Big Bernie. Yeah, Burn, legendary Burn. I built a relationship with Bernie. I already knew Hop, and so uh, that's how that happened. But yeah, Hop energy was crazy in real life. It wasn't really over the phone for me and him. It was in real life. Yeah. That, okay. So I. Okay. So Hop was just getting there for real. Yes. Yeah. Like he was that was your guy there. though. When you got there, that yeah. was your guy. Yep. And he told. He told. He must have told them about me prior to him even joining the staff. So that's how that introductory even even uh, came about. Remember back then, it was only two assistant coaches that was allowed to recruit. Right. And, he, and when he did get on, he wasn't allowed to go on a road to call recruits just yet. Right. So when you when you did get the cues, what was kind of like in your mind, like like the stamp, like the stamp of approval, like what moment, practice game, off the court, whatever it is, to where it was like, all right, yeah, I made the right decision. I'm, you know what I mean? I'm glad, I'm glad I came to cues. Man, I think it was that first time – you know, when you get there as a freshman, you got to play pickup. And, you right. you know, you was an older older guy. And when that young freshman came in, you, you had to give him work to let him know what it was. <laughs> it was just that me coming in, playing with uh, Otis Hill, who was a senior, Jason Sapolo, Ty Bergen was a junior. Um, I think I had a good day that day. And then I, I just felt like I belonged. And you know when you play good. So I felt like I belonged, and it wasn't no looking back from that moment on. So you get to Q's. You you stamp you you got your stamp of approval. You know what I'm saying in your mind, like you held it down. Cause like you said, in those beginning pickups, that's where you get that respect. You know what I'm saying? Going in, what what was your first? Cause coach really, I, I mean, I don't know how he was back then for real, but he would peek in here and there. He but he ain't sitting down the whole time. What was like? What was your first experience with coach? Um, and what was that like? Man, you know what? My first experience with coach was, you know, we all have it. Uh, it, it was it was cool, though. But you know what's crazy, man? I ain't going to lie. I didn't have, it wasn't another scholarship point guard on our roster. Uh -huh. So when, you got, when I came in from day one, Eric, the ball was in my hand. So it was a mistake. I was able to play through mistakes. Um, I was more like the baby of the team. I was a freshman, and everybody else was older class. So he kind of – I was kind of coached um, with, like, hands off, not too much of that screaming stuff. Seen a lot of my teammates go through that, but I was more like the baby. And as I grew, and our relationship grew, but it was like the ball in your hand from day one. So my confidence was super high, and um, I hadn't even had the ball in my hand from, from high school. So that was yeah. that was new for me, man. And it was cool though. You know, he he, he went along slow with me as far as my my learning curve, but uh, my experiences with Coach Bay has always been straight. I ain't never had no incidents in terms of uh, negative. It's always been good. So, like, like you said, you were the only at the time, the only scholarship point guard on the team. So he kind of, he, he, he had to, he might have had to coach you a little bit different, right? Because he ain't, he can't lose you. You know what I mean? If he look mentally, right? Yep. And that, and that's what it was, though. You know what I mean? I, I was, uh, he brought me along like that, gave me the ball. Uh, first game uh, at, at Syracuse was, uh, let's see, November '96 at the Great Alaska Shootout, playing the uh, defending national champions, Kentucky. They pressed the hell out of me. Um, all my veteran guys ran. I tried to break the press. I had seven turnovers. And so that was my that was my introduction to Syracuse basketball right there, man. Getting pressed, trying to break it. But he allowed me to go through the mistakes, and uh, I was grateful for that. Who was on that Kentucky team? Because I know, I, I think that was the year. So Ron Mercer and them, they had already left then, right? No. So Ron Mercer, Antoine Walker, and Tony Depp left. And okay. watch with Cardi. On that Kentucky team was Nazi Muhammad, Derek Anderson, Wayne Turner, Ron Ooh. Mercer. Bernard Turner. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wayne Turner's from Massachusetts, McDonald's All American. So they still had a really good team. Um, Jamal McGore was a freshman. Like well, he and I came out together. So they still was I think they was like number top five in the country. And um, you know, I think they went to the championship that year and lost to Arizona, or they was in the final four. So they had a really good team. But so your freshman year. You were the only – you were the first freshman in Big East history to lead that conference in minutes as a freshman. Like, And you talked about, you know, your first game making some mistakes, but what what gave you the confidence? Because you played a lot of minutes, but you was you had – you were successful in those minutes. So what gave you the confidence to to keep going, even though when you made mistakes? Was it coach just letting you play through it, or what, what was that? Tell me about now, more. 
I was I was a player and I teach my own son this man. I never looked over at the bench when I made a mistake. You know what I mean? I like I had already got through that 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 amazement phase of being coached by Coach Beheim. Obviously, he, he, all the coach all the players he and coach, but I never looked at the bench when I made a mistake. So I'm I'm hooping. I mean, you know, we was running two three zones, so that wasn't hard to figure that part out. Right. And then we wasn't running a whole bunch of plays. So it was kind of easy, easy adjustment. It wasn't a whole lot of thinking, man. We didn't have to worry about this, that, this, that. We didn't do no shoot around. So it was like, I'm about to go hoop. And we on ESPN. So it, it was a, it, it was an easy adjustment. And his style of coaching made it easy on me and my learning curve. And that's, I mean, I tell people that all the time. Like, coach, I mean, we have plays, but it's like, oh, fist or double fist. Come in, you know, five, man. Come set the screen. <laughs> yeah. Double fist, right? You know, you're a guard, you know, that's your favorite play. This is all you need to know. <laughs> when he do that, it's cool. You know, it's, it's, your, it's your ball. So he that's did it. That. That's it. That's it. He did that. Man, that's it. Coach, Coach really gave you the freedom to, to let you play your game. And, it, and if he messed with you, because tell me if I'm wrong, uh, but when I play, he like a dude who got some asshole in him. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he like a dude who really going to – he going to get after it and, like, not saying you're going to go back at him, but, like, you're going to let him know that shit don't bother you when he getting on. You know what I'm saying? And he respect that. Now, Beheim, man, for those that don't know, if you're soft and, and, and he can't coach you, he don't really, he can't really deal with you. He, <laughs> he only, to me, he only respects you if you got a little gangster or toughness to you. Um, when I went on my official visit, John Wallace was my coach. He said, if you ain't going to be able to handle uh, – uh, you won't be, you can't come here if you can't handle coach. He's he's a hard nosed coach and he don't like softies. And so John told me that on my official visit, and that always stuck with me. And like you said, hey, he he do like a little comeback because he knows somebody in there. And if you just keep shying away, he gonna ride you for your four years, or you gonna transfer. Man, that's a hundred percent. And and I've seen the dudes who me too. Man, I see, look, all, and, and Jay, like you said, like, because the dudes who don't respond to that or, like, go in a shell or be, like, taking it like he coming at you, like, they out of there. They transfer. Out of there. Out of there. Because your confidence is gone. Because he got confidence, so you got to match your confidence with his. He got an ego, and you got to keep yours. So, like, right. listen, you, you either going to stand with him or you going to fold. It ain't no in-between. Man, that's 100%. Did you, like, growing up, so rewind a little bit, growing up, like, when you was playing – in LA, did you you already had that type of edge with you? Like you had like growing up, I'm like for me, I played with older dudes right off top. You know what I mean? So I I kind of had that, you know, I was talking shit early because they was talking shit to me. You know, so I kind of had that in my game already. It's not something that I developed going to Syracuse. So when coach was coming at me, it was like, man, shit. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, did you already have that with you? Like you already had yeah, man, I, I think I came to, to, to Syracuse with a level of toughness. I, always was no fear, because we're on the basketball court. I mean, you know, you grew up in Michigan, man. You know, this is basketball. Y'all ain't, and none of y'all going to put your hands on me, so it's no need to be afraid. <laughs> and so I came to school with that. Um, I was looking for any, any confrontation on the court, even as a freshman. And um, that's something I came with, and I think that's who, who, who you recruit, and that's who play well under Coach Beheim. Those type of dudes with that mentality, like, man, you don't scare me at all. And so that's who do good under Coach Bayon. Man, that's 100%. Do you think, like, nowadays in college basketball, that's missing a little bit from kids, like, overall in general? I think it's missing because nowadays it's a, it's a friendlier, competitive environment. Like, I would look down at the other team when they was warming up, like, oh, look how he landed up. I don't like him. And Man. look how he wears his shoes. You think he's sweet. So I'm, I'm creating a beef with him, and they don't even know it. You know what I mean? So – now it's like I'm gonna follow you on Twitter or Instagram after the game. It's just a different, different generation now. Whether good or bad, it is what it is. But back then, I didn't like you, and I created my own beef to, towards you, whether it was one or not. Man, that's a hundred percent. Like you said, created. Man, you hit it on the head. Created your own beef. I promise you. Like, like you just said, when the dude, when the dude was over there trying to do something crazy, like a layup. Like, man, he ain't. I can't yeah, wait. To it off. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I, I was with that, man. And, I, you know, you just learn to accept the beefs. It's like, okay, y'all don't like Georgetown. I don't like Georgetown. You don't like Connecticut. I don't like Connecticut. You don't like Villanova. So I inherited every beef that was there before me. And yeah. I, I tried to, uh, you know, use it to my, to my uh, best ability to, to get those victories. And, and that's what, for me, like, that's what made it fun, though. Like, mm -hmm. when we go, you play uh, 
Villanova at noon on a Saturday or or Georgetown on a, on a CBS. You know what I'm saying? Like your fans fed off you doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like you know how you go in that dome like and, and Georgetown coming in, man, they don't like Georgetown. So like and, and then you feed so that and then they feeding off you your trash talking your edge. Like that's I don't know, man. Like that's why I feel bad for these kids. And and I said it on my last one, they can't play with these fans at the dome, man. They can't they 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 missing that experience, man. You know what I'm saying? Like and the dome and the dome fans, man, they they'll ride with you, whether you good or bad. As long as you showed effort, they will give you your your love and your respect. And I do feel bad that they can't um, get an opportunity playing from the dome because, you know, what's crazy, man. They always talk about Duke and Kentucky, low key, man. I think we got the best fans in the country, and that's that slander that we get, man. For whatever reason, you know that Syracuse and you alumni, you know we. I just don't feel that they give Bay and our school the respect. You know what I mean? They, they talk about all these other blue buds. I think we a blue bud. You know what I mean? So 100%. it's definitely a lack of respect given, but our fans are definitely the best fans for sure. I mean, you should, I, I feel like it went how they did Bayheim taking all them wins, and then yeah. North Carolina got all them classes. They ain't, you ain't hear nothing about that, but it is what it is. It is what it is, man. And and that's why that's that rebel, man. That's that Derek Coleman. That's that Pearl. That's the that's that grit, that grind, and that's I know you watch games. That's what you be looking for when you watch our Syracuse program now. Some of that, who gonna slap somebody in the mouth right now? I'm waiting to see, or who gonna talk some you know some 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 stuff to to the other players. So that's that culture that's set, and people before you and after you and myself. That's something that we establish, man. We take pride in it. That's the first thing, Jay. That's the first thing I look when I'm watching a dude play. Like when he make a mistake, when he turn the ball over or make a bad play, what are you going to do to that? Is he going to, you know what I'm saying? Like, pout or run or, or go back and, you know what I mean, try to get it back. So, yeah, that's – I need that from a player that if I'm looking at him. You know what I mean? Okay. And, and you always want to recruit something that's similar to what you are. So, that's what you search for, and that's what you like as a coach. No, absolutely. Absolutely. What what in your mind is uh, your funniest Coach Behind moment or the moment where that sticks out to you the most? Because we all – I mean, I ask everybody who's on the podcast, but – and we got stories. You sh- I mean, Lawrence has some. Wes Johnson has some. I know you got some. Man, I had one, man. It was one I wasn't really too proud of. But <laughs> it was uh, – <laughs> it was – we was playing at home. And, you know I mean? I had – like you said, I had played all the minutes and, and over my career. And so – you know, I hadn't played games, hurt, whatever, you know. So it was my junior year. We was playing Providence at home. And um, I didn't feel good for whatever reason. I took too much painkillers. And so my stomach was was bothering me. I had to get an IV at halftime. And he was trying to r- rattle me up. Jay, come on. And, man, he he said something. I couldn't play. I, I felt bad. And I barked back at him, man, and Hop held me back. I was ready to knock his teeth out, man, because, you know, how dare you question me, man. And, he figured that I had to have been sick. But, yeah, that was my one moment, man, my junior year at home versus Providence. And I, we didn't like them neither. But that was my one moment, man, where we, where we got at it. We was about to fight. And that's where I learned, like, man, this dude really, he's super competitive. Bayheim is competitive, man. That's why he only plays six dudes or seven dudes. Yeah. Because he don't even got no time for no BS. He going <laughs> to play seven dudes. And if you ain't in that seven rotation from practice, dude, you can forget about it. Man, that's 100%. And this year is kind of different just because with everything going on. So you might have to, a dude who had to sit out because of the virus or whatever. But it's, and we got a little bit of depth this year. But man, listen, like you said, you ain't in that seven man because he's sticking with you. You're going you gonna to play 35 minutes. Well, that's his thing as a coach. That's, that's, that's the beauty of what he do. He, he giving, instead of playing somebody two and three minutes, I'm going to give Eric all them minutes so he can just stay confident and warmed up. Because I'm only going to play this dude two minutes, so I'm really wasting him even being out there. That's why the big games, everybody always going to go 37, 37, 37, 30. Because he don't have no time to warm nobody else up if it's a big game. So that's the beauty in him. And um, I'm rolling with it, man. I, I like how he do it. And he, I mean, it, that's that trust factor too, right? Like he, he trusts like you're going to make a mistake. He trusts that you're going to get that back. He know he know he he know what he got in you, so he don't gotta worry about that mistake because he already know you passed that little test with him where a turnover is nothing. That's a fact. That's a, that's a hundred percent. So we we talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, you, you really you were known from a defender like probably the best one of the best on ball defenders you know I ever. So I remember a quick story. I remember, man, it had to be my sophomore year. You came up to practice. You came up and it was when it was in Manly, and I just remember. I think you were. Do you remember? 
Yeah, we, we I came up there for y'all at Lee Camp. Okay, yeah. I played pickup with y'all. Yes. Two days in a row, we played at Manly, and then we played at the Dome. I remember that. Like that's 07, 07, yes, that's 08, 07, 08, 08, 07, 06, one, somewhere around there. I remember that for sure. Yeah, I, but that, that's where I was like, because they, you know, Hop told me, because Hop my guy, so Hop was like, Jay Hart coming up, that's my guy. That's, you know, that's my guy. He going to lock you. He going to lock you up. He, <laughs> like he told me, but, but then when we played, I'm like, man, damn, like, the instincts and just being able to, cause man, that's hard to play D, man. I don't care. It's especially like nowadays, you see how good these dudes are with the ball in their hands. And to be a good defender, like more than anything well, for you, like what does it take to be a good defender? Is it just, just heart, like effort? What is it? You know what? It's definitely heart and effort, but it's also being blessed with like instincts, anticipation. Yeah. You know, I wasn't like the fastest or the biggest, but I think I had really good instincts on defense. And um, I think being a good defender is um, playing somebody and just force them to where you want them to go and living with the results. So I think a lot of times, um, you know, you try to – I can't guard Eric David over all, over all over the court, but I'm going to get him on this side, and this is the only place he's going to go. So he's either going to hesitate right, shoot on me, or go to the hole, and I'm just going to cut the court off. I, you can't play good players all over the court. You just got to get them in the corner and keep them on that side. And that's what I tried to do. And that's big, like you said, and live with the results. Like – I. Look, I played good D. That's a tough shot. Hey, good. It's called what? Good D, better O, right? So you know what I mean. That's 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 the notion you got to get when you you playing defense because you can't take it personal. And then obviously you got to have some pride and you know a little bit of quickness. Absolutely. So I mean, we we talked before um, we came on a little bit. Um, you were known for your def for your defense, but at Q's you scored fifteen hundred points. You had over seven hundred assists. You're you're I think top three top four and all time accused and assists and then 1500 points. That's a lot of points in, in a Syracuse career. Like, did you feel like that, that, that part of your game was kind of overlooked or was that maybe more so when you got to the league more so and then at, at being at Cuse? When I came to Syracuse as a defender, I got recruited there because I, I mean, I scored in high school, but I played good defense young. And then you got to think, man, we played all zone too. Just like you play, well, you know, what we played man too, looking back on our games, but, um, I came in averaging 10 as a freshman, 11 as a sophomore. My junior year, that was the year all my upperclassmen left. And as you know, when you get your year, he just, you know, turn you loose. So um, my junior year, he allowed me to shoot whenever, uh, uh, whatever. And that was the year where he allowed me to score. But then I realized that my senior year, I need to get more people involved. So I made the transition on my own to still get, you know, assists and score. But – Hey, he ran plays for me, man. I don't know if he had to play call for you. It was like 51. That was, that was my play call. 51 yeah. and double fist. He, he would call that loud. And I said, uh-oh, my time to shoot. That was me, yeah. two play. Two play. Two. You go, you, that's when you go down and come off that curl and then go to work. That's it. So, so mine was 51. I would come off a flare and then right. come off a floppy screen. So I either had the flare. If I didn't have a flare, I would go down to the box and come off the floppy. So yours was two curl. Mine was flare, come off. And, and. When they give you the green, you, your confidence is sky high, man. So you already know, you know, how, how it is. And I watch you in college, so I already know what, what the freedom he gives his players. The freedom, and he liked to do this. Like, that's like when I, I, when I think about Syracuse basketball and all the, you know, Syracuse hoops I watch, like, the real good teams, the zone work, they active, and then they doing this. Like, they getting up and down. Like, they, it's we not. Got they, we, got, we got up and down, man. We averaged like 80-some points, man. My, my, my last – Two-year teams, man, we was fast, break, no play. We didn't want to run no play, right? We didn't have a lot anyway, but we got up and down, and we shared with each other. So my senior year, I think we started off like 21, 22, and 0. And that was that team, um, you know, where we should have won championship. We lost to uh, Michigan State in Sweet 16. But, Auburn Hills. Yeah, Auburn Hills, exactly, at the Palace, yep. But we would get up and down, and, and that's what he wanted. That's what the program was built on with Pearl. Sherman Douglas live. That's why I got. I learned. I watched all those guys throw live. So that's where the program was built on that that style of play. And his better teams always pushing in transition. So let like let's talk about that game a little bit more. Tell me about that game versus Michigan State because that was a Sweet 16, Auburn Hill. So Michigan State had the crowd, but they ended up they won it that year. They did. They with, did. That was with Mo Cleese, Mo Pete, uh, Andre Bill. Hudson, Charlie Bill, Andre Hudson, Jason yep. Richard was a freshman. But you know what? We up 18 at halftime or 17 yeah. at halftime, man. And 
they walked us down, man. They um they would just start making threes. Then the, the refs tried to change, and then we ended up losing by like plus twelve. So that was like a 30, 35 point swing. But uh to me, man, it was a uh, it was one of them years where that was my better year of, of the four years team wise. And I just felt if we would have played them anywhere but Auburn Hills, we could have got them. Right in right at that was their home court. Yeah, that was their home court. And they obviously they have more fans because it was closer to them. So um, that's just an unfortunate situation. That's how it go. But three years later, we end up getting a chip. So you still got to ride for, for Carmelo and his group. Oh, yeah, 100%. What What do you think for you? What's your favorite Q's game, your favorite Q's moment? It doesn't have to – it could be whatever. It could be a game or it could be just a moment where you'd be like, this, this is my favorite. Oh, my favorite Q's moment is, is – I'll never forget it. It's when we we uh we were 16-0. and 0. We played UConn at home. They had won a championship the previous year. Um, and we, we, I think we beat them one time the previous year. My senior year, we ran them out the gym. Uh, the, everybody rushed the floor, like February 2000. And so we, we ended up blowing them out. And that was just for us, like from all them losses we took from them earlier in the years, um, that, that, that moment would stick with me forever. And then you know, our, our, our team, my team, we got a group little group text where we all still stay tapped in and we, we reminisce on that game as well. So was, would you say, would you say, while you were at Cuse, that was the biggest rival that whole time while you were there? No question. Because Georgetown wasn't really – like, Iverson left when I got there as a freshman. So, although Georgetown, you, you know, our fans came out and supported that, UConn was cracking. UConn won a chip in 99. UConn was – you know, they was it, it was turning up over there. And, and so, for me, my biggest rival in college is UConn by far. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't – that's one school – that I don't like. Every time I see them on TV, man, I want them to lose. And uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, you know, again, it was, you know, Jim Calhoun, super cocky coach, always had really good teams. They was always prepared to play physical. And so um, UConn was my rival, man. So anytime we could beat a UConn team, I, I, that was big for me. So the, I, I get what you're saying. Like, even still this day, when you see UConn, you like, nah, I, I need y'all to lose. Man, we played – so, you know, I'm coaching now at SC. We played right. UConn three weeks ago in, in, at the Mohegan Sun. And I talked to Kevin Freeman, who was on the team. He's an assistant coach as well. And I was like, man, I still hate this. You know, I still hate y'all colors. I still hate – you know, everything. he started laughing because we had some wars. And obviously we lost that game, man. But I do not like losing to UConn whatsoever or anything, man. So that, that was my – I can't stand it. So, so like I had like growing up, I had three teams that, and I don't know why, man. That I just, like you said, I just didn't like. I just didn't like them, like for some reason. And they were good. They was good. Like it, it ain't had nothing to do with with that. But it was Duke, uh -huh. San Antonio, and Utah. And I know you played for both. Like you played for both teams. But now I'm a Utah fan because of Elijah. But uh, I don't know, man. It was just something. It was those three teams. Was like, man, I hope y'all lose, man. Man, I, I didn't like watching Duke because they always used to huddle at the free throw line. I was like, man, that shit, that's weak, man. They always huddle in, five, five in and picking you up. I, was, <laughs> I feel you on the Duke one, man. I was like, man, look at them dudes just tucking in and jersey tucked in. You know, we was more on some, you know, Syracuse used to recruit them, them hard-nosed roughnecks. And that's yeah. that's what I like, man. But I'm with you with the Duke. The other two, man, it, it is what it is, those programs. Like, I, I play for Utah as well. So, um, Elijah's there now, too. So, that's that's a good thing. Duke did it for me, man. I didn't, I didn't like all that huddling at the free throw line. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why I dislike Utah and San Antonio. I don't know why they they good organizations. I don't know. I don't know. Cause they I mean. win like a certain way. It's not edgy. It's that clean. You know, like I ain't. I didn't do nothing illegal. You know what I mean? So that's why you probably it's, it looks soft, but it ain't. I get you. Right. It ain't. It definitely ain't. Shoot, it I ain't. Definitely ain't. But it just looked like that. That's a fact. That's a. Fact. So two thousand. Uh, you know, you, you have a great Syracuse career, obviously one of the best point guards to come through. Um, and then you get drafted by Milwaukee. Uh, tell me about that night. You know, just, just kind of, you know, bring me back to that moment. Um, where were you? You know, who was with you? And, and what were the emotions, you know, and everything like going through you? Well, man, you know, it was 2000. I was at my mom's house and we, she had like a draft party. But, uh, you know, I had it expected to get drafted and, you know, did my workouts. I didn't know where I was going. And so for anybody who does get drafted, the longer you wait, you you feel like, damn, I may not. So um, my, my I got called during a commercial. 
So it wasn't until they came back on the, the, the commercial that I knew I got drafted. So it was a it was a surreal moment. It was something that you dream of um, your whole life. And then obviously to get drafted to Milwaukee, man, it was just an uphill battle. And you know, I, so at that time I got drafted to Milwaukee. Sam Cassell was a starter. Lindsey Hunter was the backup. Ray first skipped to my Lou was a third. And I got to make the team. So that's where that, that, that toughness that we talked about earlier, that's where that part kicked in naturally to compete. And that's how I made that team. Because I was the fourth point guard. And, you know, from there on, I, I figured this my career was going to be a grind out. And that's kind of how I made it in the NBA. So, like, that first training camp, you, I mean, you talked about the guys just there. Like, were they the type of guys who, who was kind of helping you make it? Or was it like they was at your neck regardless? No, nah, you know what, Sam – I wasn't a threat to Sam Cassell or Lindsey Hunter. So Ray Foster was in his second year in the league. So, you know, he and I had a lot of battles and elbows and pushing and all that. So, I mean, he didn't make it sweet for me and he wasn't supposed to. The other two, I wasn't even in they, you know, they, they didn't have to worry about me because I wasn't a threat to them. You know, I was trying to become a threat to the third third guy, which was Ray Foster at the time. So um, you learn early on that it's friends, but then it's not friends because this is how people feed their family. So um, that that's the part of the competition you have to uh, you have to be able to bring that every day. So I mean, you you were in the NBA for ten years, ten year career, right? I mean, yeah. that's a blessing. Like, yeah. But, well, I don't know what the the average. It's probably like three years, right? Maybe three, three and a half. Three and a half is the average time. Three and a half, and and people don't. And then after that, it's probably just four. So whatever it is, the next, you know what I'm saying. So have a ten year career, and then you were able to. You traveled around. Like, I'm, I'm going to name the teams right now. So, Milwaukee, San Antonio, uh, Charlotte, Bobcats, uh, Sacramento, Utah, Clippers, Nuggets, and then the Hornets. Yep. Out of all those teams, who was, like, the one guy – Or and it doesn't have to be on those teams. It could be, like, guys you played against. But who who was the one guy you who you really learned the most from in the league? You know what I mean? Who you really took the most from and maybe even kind of use it today with you? Well, I learned the most my rookie year from from a, it was our center. His name was Irvin Johnson. Um, he showed me what it was to be a pro. Um, he told me, you know, come do your job every day, stay before, stay after. You don't have to kiss no ass. Just do your best and, and stand on your principles and, and be who you are. Don't be a follower. A lot of times, you know, young guys like myself at the time um, come in the league and the veterans would be impressionable on you, so you'll start trying to live their life. So he showed me that it's okay to be comfortable in your own skin. And uh, actually, he and I still talk, um, not regularly, but I still check in with him from time to time. So he was the, he was the guy that, I was, uh, that taught me the most. Um, Friendship-wise, who, who, who's my closest one I'm still really good friends with when I played in Sacramento, Sharif Abdul-Rahim. So, um, you know, you don't have a lot of friends in the NBA. And so when, when you do get some, you, those relationships last for a long time. And funny because, so Sharif had a big uh, a big house down in Atlanta in uh, Smyrna. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if you remember the name. You remember Rodney Hurd? Yeah, I know Rodney Hurd. So Rodney, you know, I know Rod, Rodney from Detroit. So, you know, I was I was growing up with her. But we used to go in the summertime, every summer, go work out at Sharif Abdul at his house. Because he, he, he had a big gym in the house. And I just the thing that stuck out with me was Sharif, just how, like, like you said, like, you know, you got dudes who in the league, so automatically they feel like they up here. You know what I'm saying? They, But the first thing with, with with Sharif when I met him was, like, man, down to earth dude. Like, like a, just just want to help out. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I think, I think a lot of times, like, when dudes get drafted, even it, they can be super talented, but they get put in the wrong situation, and then like they had the wrong veterans around them. Like like you said, you got drafted to where it was a blessing with Irvin Johnson to be there because he he shows you the right way. You know what I'm saying? Like he didn't like you're not going out partying and doing all that, spending all your bread and all that. He that's like that's like a big part like where you get drafted and and who is in your circle like when you as a rookie, right? It can make your career, man. Look at the quarterback from the Washington uh, football team. He got cut today. Yeah. Two years, first round pick, and, and they said we don't want you here no more. So um, it's definitely good to have veterans around you, but it's also good to know who you are prior to coming into that locker room as well. So um, hopefully that uh, the kid from the Washington is a learning lesson for everybody else coming after him in all sports. 
Yeah, and I, and I think it's like a duty too. Like, and I, I know you experienced because you was the vet. When you was the vet at one time coming in a rookie. Like, it's it's it should be like a vet's duty to go ahead and kind of like go to the rook. Like, hey, listen, bro. Like, this is really what you need to focus on. And, and once you get this certain amount of time in the league, then okay, maybe you could do what you do. But for this, once you get in here, like these is X, Y, and Z. This is what you need to do to be successful and to stay in because. It's not easy to stay in. You, you, a lot of people don't get past that first contract. Man, you ain't never lied. You know, when Johnny was a rookie, man, I was I went to Minnesota his rookie year. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, he had a great year too as a rookie year. Um, uh, and um, it was a learning curve for him because you got to think he was used to coming from Bayhan, and then we get Kurt Rambis was trying to run the run the triangle, and it was opposite of what he was good at. You know what I mean? It didn't make no sense for him. And so he was trying to figure it out. But, yeah, man, it's a, it could be tough. If, wherever you get drafted to it, if, if it's not a good fit, it won't work. Yeah, because Johnny was one of the most talented dudes I ever played with. You know what with I'm saying? Ball, like he, with the ball in his hand. So you got to think he went from playing ball in his hand to get drafted high to playing triangle. Same office as Derek Fisher. And that's not hit. That wasn't his game. Right. He, 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 Derek Fisher cutting through, spotting up, getting it off the kick out or something like that. Johnny, creator, pick and roll, double fist, like me and you said, thumb up, pick and roll. So that, that wasn't a good fit for him. But, you know, him as a rookie going through that, watch him learn, uh, he, he did the best that he could in that situation. Yeah, and he still made all rookie, I believe, all rookie team. Johnny Flynn was cold. Johnny Flynn was cold, Jay, <laughs> for real. Cold, man. Yep. What, what, do you, what, what would you say your, your favorite moment in the league was? It, Again, same thing I asked you about the cues. It could be a game, practice. What was kind of the, that moment where you'd be like, damn, this is cool? Man, it was my maybe fourth year in the league. I was playing for the Charlotte Bobcats. I was playing, um, was playing the Washington Wizards in Charlotte. Man, I had like 19 points in the fourth quarter. Ooh. So, you know, and that, that just for like, you know, people, like you said, I was a defender. But at the time, it was a record. Man, I had 19 in the fourth quarter or 18, and um, it was my, you know, that year I was able to score the ball because I was, it was a more, the team we wasn't that good, but he allowed us all to play. So that was, that was my proudest moment, man. I got a chance to get busy um, with the ball in my hands. Felt like college, so that, I'll never forget that moment. It, and it's crazy because, man, it's so many, like everybody in the league talented, right? And, no and, and at one time, like you was probably the man on your team in college, like. Yep. Yeah, all, everybody, everybody in the league was the man on their team in college. And so it's a lot of ego checking when you get there, like, damn, this dude's really good. Like, I was a man in Syracuse, and I get to Milwaukee. It's a dude on their team named Ray Allen. It was his third year in the league, fourth year in the league. You know how cold he was. And then on the, on the other wing was Glenn Robinson. Oh, big dog. Big dog. Power four was another friend of mine who, who might hear Tim Thomas. So just think of that. Like, where, where the shots at for me? So, you, you know, you got to learn how you can contribute to that particular team. And um, I've been around some good ones, man. Played with David Robinson, Tim Duncan. So I ain't seen what it looked like. You know what I mean? I, I seen what it what, a, what something, one of them special ones looked like. And I got a chance to play with a, a few of them. Well, how, how hard was that for you, though? Like, like you said, coming from Q's, you the man. Like, th going to Milwaukee, you know, just trying to make the team. You know what I mean? Like, how, how did you check yourself, check your ego? Well, shit. It, it, I, I mean, whether I wanted to check it or not, them dudes yeah. is better than me. <laughs> it ain't like, I can't like lie like, man, nah, them dudes is better than me, man, period, point blank. They was all stars making 100 million. And so it was just like, damn, they there. I just got to try to work as hard just to be on the practice court with these guys. And, and, and the ego was cool. It wasn't no checker for me, man. I was just honored and, and appreciative to be there. So you know when somebody better than you. And, um, you know, it was, that's not a diss to say. Ray Allen and Sam Cassell was better than me as a rookie. They ain't no this. Right. No, but but a lot of dudes taking it like that. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? Like, and that's that puts you out the lead. And that's why they don't stick. You know what I mean? That's exactly why people don't stick. Cause it's you gotta have humility at the same time. And you wanna have super confident and be cocky, but you gotta live in reality too. And I think I chose to, to live in reality. And and that worked out. Ten years in yeah. the league. That it worked, worked out for me, man. Yep, it worked out for me. Um, I was able to play for a lot of teams and, and, and learn a lot of systems, see play for some great coaches. The best thing about playing in the league, man, I, I did get 10 years grateful, but I played for Greg Popovich, George Carl, 
um, Bernie Bickerstaff, Mike Dunleavy, rest in peace to Jerry Sloan, uh, Rick Adaman, who was a hell of a coach in Sacramento. So for me, man, when I do become a head coach, I got him. And all those guys to me are Hall of Famers, or they probably already already in there. So I was able to get some good coaches in my stops as well. Yeah, that's all them coaches you just named, all Hall of Fame coaches, like some of the top coaches in NBA history. Exactly. So that was the blessing. Along playing with the 10, it was learning like, damn, these different strategies from these basketball coaches that I can put all of me in, and along with Bayhan. So I've been fortunate to have nothing but Hall of Fame coaches in my basketball journey. Yeah, blessing right there. So we talked about 10 years in the NBA. And then you go, you after you, you retire, you hop right into coaching, but you start with on the high school level at Taft. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you go, and then you got Pepperdine, and then you, you've been at uh, USC where you've been, um, where you're at right now. What was, yeah. did you know you wanted to coach? I mean, what was that transition like for you going from playing to coaching? Because now, like for me, like when I, like when I teach, it's, it's harder, like people don't understand because when you a coach, like you know what you're talking about, but you got to explain it to this dude who doesn't. You know what I'm talking about? So how was that for you, transitioning from playing to coaching? Man, you know what? It was it was a good transition because when I stopped playing and hopped into coaching, I didn't know my surroundings. It was, it was back where I was from, but I didn't know the AAU world. Right. So it was me coming in humble, like trying to learn who is who and what is what. I didn't come in like I played this dude, you know, do this. I'm trying to learn this whole little landscape from the parents to the talent level, I'm evaluating everything. So I never clashed with ego from where I played. It was all good, because I was driving vans. You know how it is, AAU and laughing with the kids. Yeah. So it was just building up equity with the community. And I knew if I wanted to be a college coach, I had to know all these parents, I had to know all these AAU coaches, so I could be needed. You can't be no college coach if you ain't needed and you don't know nobody. Like. I can know everything, how the teacher run a pick and roll or this, that, but if I don't know the people where the players is coming from, that won't do you no good. So that part, that two year part or me, um, before I even got on, I did that for two years and I was able to learn the landscape and, and build up the relationship. So when I did get the job, it was getting players wasn't hard. And so that was, a, that was the fun part, that two years where I was out in the streets meeting and, and, and figuring this whole thing out. So that's so it sounds like you already this is what you wanted to do when you oh, yeah, I, oh yeah definitely I wanted I didn't want to coach in the NBA because I was already you know that's 82 games and then you know you, you've been away from your family a lot so no I knew college was was where I wanted to be at um it's like working back at and you're in education you're in a school so um it's a level of respect you got to have when you're working on the school campus um certain do's and don'ts just like any other school and that's a place where you could touch the kids before they get out into their, their, their adult life. And that's where I want to be. It's, it's satisfaction for me. Absolutely. Uh, giving back, giving back what you learn. Man, trying to and trying to see the next person's dreams come to come true like mine did. So that's the whole purpose of this whole thing right here. Man, that's, that's, you said it right there. That's the whole purpose, man. It, it'd be selfish for all the basketball. Like you just named all those coaches. Yeah. Coach Bayheim, Adam, Mr. Jerry Salone, Popovich, all the knowledge that you can gain. Man, it'd be selfish for us not to be able to kind of share it and pass it on to the next, right? And man, and you know what? The biggest thing, it ain't even X and O's, man. It's just about having real relationships and, and, and genuine love for the kids or student athletes. If you start treating them like numbers, like, oh, he weak, next one come in, he weak, next one come in. Man, before you know it, you ran off 20 players, you know what I mean, that you thought was good in, 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 at the high school level. So it's about – understanding where each kid from in his background and approaching them like that, as opposed to saying, Eric is like Jason Hart, Jason Hart, like Alan Griffin, everybody's different. And so that's the part I've learned um, coaching in college is not to treat every player the same. And um, every kid has a different relationship with the coach. Absolutely. And they go and man, these kids are going to talk too, how they're being treated, right? They're going to tell the next because they boy play too. Man, you're trying to recruit that kid. You, you got him now. I'm trying to go back to the to the Warriors, right? Ain't that your program, Michigan Warriors? Michigan. Oh, Michigan Hurricanes. Hurricanes. I came and watched you play with Hop before at, at Cal State Dominguez, uh, 2004 or five. We was, we was in LA. He came out here, and I was I went over there and watched you play. So Hop had to do you right so he can go back to your program. You know what I mean? So that's that's how, that's relationships and recruiting. 
if I would have messed you over, if Syracuse would have messed you over, nobody wouldn't want to follow your, your, your footsteps. So it's about staying, staying true to who you are and having some integrity. That's 100%. Uh, that's rare nowadays. It, 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 you say it as smooth as that, but, man, listen, that's rare. Very rare. Because nowadays, the kids want the success day one. Now, I want you to have the success day one, but what if you're not ready? So is it my fault you're not ready? Because I just got you in September and we play in November. It's going to take some time. So um, the kids are a little bit less patient, you know, because basketball is a global thing and everybody's a pro at 11 years old. You know, I get it. But uh, you just got to have some <laughs> patience with it. <laughs> have a little patience with it, man, and just keep getting better. So, okay, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. So, you know, you recruiting me. I'm, I'm your recruit. You recruiting me. You take an official visit uh, to the house. You know, parents in there, family in there. What's the, what, what's the first thing you, you saying to really get the get their attention, get the players' attention, get the family's attention? I'm never going to lie to you. I'm always going to be 100% honest. Um, and it's for the kids coming to USC. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, so I'm never running. I'm never going to run and not pick my phone up or run from my city. Um, the same way we're dialoguing today, we're going to be able to dialogue if he go 10 games without playing. So I'm going to give you my utmost of who I am, you could never say I'm fake. Um, and, and whatever he produced, he, that, that's what he going to earn. That's the minute he's going to earn. So that, that's my spiel all the time in recruiting. I ain't going to lie. I'm going to always tell the truth. If he's playing good, he's playing good. If he's not, he's not. I'm going to always tell the truth. And I'm never going to run from my phone. I'm not going to not pick it up because I don't want to hear what you're going to say. I'm going to give you that respect. That's, that, that's big, too. That's big. And, and I think for me, too, like, I didn't realize it, Jay, when I was kind of, when I was hooping, because you know our focus we was just on hoop. Like I wasn't really thinking about the big picture and how like when I go to a university like Syracuse, all the connections I could get. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know what I mean? So I think what's big for me and what you know what's had what's happened is still being able to be in contact with those people when you're done. You know what I mean? Like talking to Coach Hop, talking to Coach Bayheim, talking to Bernie, like. I want to have that. I want to have that because we. I've spent a lot of time with you, and I put a lot of my, I sacrifice a lot of my family time. Like all the times we we don't go home for Christmas or Thanksgiving. You know what I mean? And and you know we we at your house, so like I still want to have those relationships after. You know what I mean? To I think that's big. Well, and that's when you get recruited too, as well, man. It's a forty year decision. Are you going to that school because they got some nice tennis shoes, or you want to? Let that degree do something for you when you can't no longer serve the fans athletically. And that's this whole part about when you pick these schools, man, make sure you're going somewhere where the education is valid. And then when you, it's a 40 year decision, man. Like me and you lucky, man, our coach still there. That's you know great. how many dudes go to other schools? They school had like seven, eight coaches. You know what I'm saying? So if Bernie didn't, that situation, he would still be there. So me and you lucky to where we still have our, our, our head coach there to where, if we come back, he gonna treat us with the same respect that he did when we played, and that's not normal. And so, um, that's that's the beauty that, uh, of, of me and you going to Syracuse. And and it too, like it's lucky too because we can talk to each other. We got the same stories, you know what I'm saying? Like we, you know what I mean? So like I tell that to everybody. My man been at Syracuse for 46 years, man. Like that's not like Jay. That ain't happened nowhere else. It probably would never happen again, man. Ain't no pro. Ain't no AD. No president gonna let you coach for more than if it's just Chesky <laughs> and Bayon. But you you got four years, man. If you don't get it around in four years, we're gonna fire you. And then really three if you if you tripping. So yeah. Now nah, Bayheim would never, it'll never be another Bayheim man ever again. And that don't even that don't even exist anymore. He he'll coach there until he's probably 80. Yeah, and we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> hey, so describe these people slash players to me in a few words. Mike Hopkins, and if you got a, if you got a Mike Hopkins story, I need to hear that because you know I love those. Oh man, well we we doing it. The, 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 the guy went on the floor, um, rolled the ball out. Man, I'm saying I'm freshman. I'm like this dude. We wasn't doing it the way he wanted to do it. Man, this fool dove on the floor, sliding with his clothes on. I said, man, this dude really crazy. I thought he was playing, but it was really genuine energy, man. And Hop gave you that energy. Um, every day. And I don't know how he did it because he gave it to a lot of people. And you know, that normally can wear you down. You know, a hopper goes silent on you too. So, yeah. yes. Um, 
that energy that he was giving out was genuine. And that was just his passion, man. He only wanted us to get better. He didn't care about all that other bull. He was a coach that wanted you truly to get better and he cared about you off the court. And then coaches like Hot Bro are rare. Rare, dude. Rare. He 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 really genuinely cared for us. So you don't find him. Yeah, that rare. Like like I, we was just talking about. Still talk to him now. Like I know it's you still talk to him now. Like that's Man, he, he had that effect on me, man. That I want to, I want to keep that relationship, you know. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. It's a fact. Etan Thomas. Etan Thomas. Let me see, Ronnie Cycli. You hate doing the best and all that, but probably the best center out of Syracuse defense. If you look at his numbers, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, he's militant. He's always been confident in who he is as a person. Never wavered. Never changed. And um, that's why we called him the big dog. You know what I mean? He, he was who he was. He wasn't no follower. He was a true leader. And um, he, 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 was, uh, he, he was big dog to us. And, and you can see that today with everything he's doing. Like, he's not, like, he not wavering. Like, he's no. he going to keep it 100. A, a hundred, a thousand percent. And, and that's how he was when he got to Syracuse. This ain't no front. This is who he is. Yeah. I, I love that about Edo. I love that. That's a fact. And this, so this guy right here, man, he was like, I, I went back and look at some some games. Like, he was ultra talented, man, for me. I thought he would have played in the, like, he was the type of guy like the league has right now. Who oh, is Damone Brown. Ooh, man, slim. <laughs> hey, one of the one one of the smoothest uh, players from, from representing that, uh, that Buffalo, uh, New York. Um, genuine dude, man. Uh, Obviously, he played in the league. He got, he got some years in the league, and he did well when he got his opportunity. Yeah. Um, it's an archer, a forward that, uh, that, 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 that came along and did well. But you know what? He's a typical – like, I was a four-year player. Behind be finding them four-year guys like him to where – and myself to where they you get you a lot of wins. You know what I mean? And he was – he and I, we went to school for three years together. I was a year older than him, just like he timed. Behan be finding them four-year players, man, that stay and get you. Derek Homer did it too. Sherman Douglas, all of us. So he 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 was one of them players along myself, man, to where you know he got us a lot of wins. You know, you know, uh I don't know if there's much that much more that Coach Behan care about than winning. He loved oh, he loved to win some games. He loyal to that. For real. So if you ain't if you ain't loyal to that or trying to help him with that, he he deuces. That's you know, he loyal to winning first and foremost. <laughs> he hey, harsh with it. He ain't giving a damn. That's a hundred right there. That's a hundred. I'm gonna bring you back a little bit, make you think a little bit. Okay. Your favorite, your favorite spot back when you was in the Cuse in college that you go, it could be Marshall Street. I you know, I had my spots. What's your favorite spot? Restaurant, whatever it is. Um, Cosmos, man. I would get up, man, it'd be like 10 degrees, man. I would go get me some food before before. Breakfast before class, man. So it was Cosmos on uh, which street is that? Marshall. Yes. Yeah, Cosmos on Marshall, man. I don't know if it's still there, man. They had the best pancakes and eggs. And then um, Goldstein. Okay. On campus. So you keep it on South. I I lived on South my first year, and then I okay. moved off campus the last three. But those are my two spots where I frequent that all the time. And Cosmos had that breakfast. They gone now, but I was upset um, about that. They gone. Wow. Man. Well, what's there? Man, Jay, they got a, a Verizon spot or something, man. Well, you know, everything got to get modernized, man. You know what I mean? They built, like, some little a building over there, too, by David Falk, right, right next to the, the hotel. So I stayed at the hotel right there on, for my official visit on campus. They, yeah, yeah, they got – it's a whole bunch of new stuff now. Like, they Coach got a something where it's old dorms built on Marshall Street and everything. Oh, okay, okay. Is the hotel still there? What's that hotel called? Oh, Sheraton. Sheraton, yeah, that's where I stayed for my official visit. You probably stayed there too. Yeah, you know that's right there in the thick of it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right by Shine. You going? You walking right in the Shine? That's where you went. Pick. That's where I went. Picked up my check at the Shine bookstore, <laughs> another food spot. So, that's and uh, Syracuse, man, it was the best four years of my life. And you probably could say the same too. It's, it, 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 when you look back on, like, damn, I was here and really lived here, but it was the best four years of my life. And that was led by the basketball because our runs was crazy. Right, man, 100%. That's a good segue to the next question. 
what what does the Syracuse fan base, the Syracuse community mean to you? Like what all the support means, like I still feel like I play. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What is that? What do they mean to you, man? It mean a lot, man, because they stamped you, they stamped me. And to me to get stamped by the fans is valid is enough validation for me because I know all the guys all my brothers that came through before me were really good players. And so just to be stamped by them and got their approval was killer, man. Um, the fan base, the alumni, um, it was, it, it, it's always been great love. And like I said, I think we had the best fans um, in the country by far. Yeah. And, and it's cra- It's still crazy to me too, Jay, because like I grew up watching you guys, like you, uh, Etan, uh, you know, DC, like DC from Detroit. So I remember uh, Mellow, like GMAC. And now like, you my guys, like, you know what I'm saying? So like, for me, it's like, it's like humbling, right? Because like, these are all my basketball, my ba- the, my role models, you know what I'm saying? That I really got to, and now it's like, that's how Syracuse family is though, right? Like, it's like, we talked about coach being here for 46 years, but the relationships that we build, like, I might, like the first time I met DC, I never met him in my life. He act like I know, like he know me for ten years. You know what I'm saying? Like that's 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 what Syracuse family is. Well, and that's what DC know Behan when he brought you in. He knew you as a player, regardless. You was his little brother. When I got to Syracuse in '96, man, Pearl Washington guided me. Rest in peace. I was in a going. He picked me up, taking me to the boys and girls club to speak to kids, um, doing community work. What you doing? So. And then with him passing not too long ago, man, that hurt me because he took me under my wing. Even when I was struggling, he was there, man, like a genuine. He didn't have to do none of that. He could have sat back and talked about me or whatever, man. So he really, you know, took me under his wing as a freshman, man, the, the legend, Pearl. And that that was, that was I'll never forget that, man, what he did for me. We talk about rare people. Man, he was rare, man. Like, just like, hey, man, he was – genuine as they come, like one of the nicest dudes, man. Pearl Washington, man, that's why he was loved. And like, he the reason to me, he set, he set it off. He was, like, Bayon probably got in, what, four or five years later of his coaching career, but he set it off, period. He set it off. He the one, made, probably why you went there, because you watched somebody else, and same with me. He set it off, first and foremost. He said he was doing stuff with the ball. that They weren't doing that type of stuff back then. He was really like they first under Bayheim, big time recruit. Yeah, Bayheim had some other pros prior to, you know what I mean? But Pearl Washington is the one who made it like, you know what? Syracuse is cracking. So right. he kind of was the innovator to me in, in, in the Bayheim era. No, that's a fact. So I, I think about this too. And what's going to happen when Coach retired, man? Because for me, selfishly, I wanted to be, I wanted to be kept in the family. You know what I'm saying? That's just me selfishly, and that's probably because I want to still go up to the mellow and do all that. But which, I mean, what you think is gonna happen, man? Uh, I think uh, when he do retire, I think Hopper Lee Washington go back. He's getting good practice right now um, at Washington, and doing a good job. And so, I mean, that's just me. I don't, I don't. I haven't, Hopper ain't told me this, so I don't want to start a right. rumor. But oh, I no. think it, the. the <laughs> The, the long lost son, son will go back home to Syracuse, which is his adopted homeland. And I think he'll keep the tradition going. And that's just me speaking. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to definitely be somebody from our, from, from Syracuse blood. Cause that's how it's always been. And I think that's how Bayon would want it. That's a fact. Like I, I just wanted to be within the family. You know what I'm saying? Like it just be weird for me if you bring on a whole nother, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, and because, then, hey, cause you know why that's going to, me and you going to be the outsiders now. You know what I mean? That's selfishly hey, speaking. Selfish, selfish, selfish. I want to call and still get that little Syracuse sweatshirt or that T-shirt or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. That new coach coming in, he's gonna be like, "Man, we ain't doing none of that no more." So that's real. That's a fact. That's a fact. Okay, last question, Jay. Uh, we we'll talk about uh, your team a little bit. USC. What are your expect- expectations for the rest of the year? I know it's with a lot going on. Um, you know, just in generally speaking, with the season and then. But your team, you guys got some, man, you got them them twins. Yeah. Mobley twins, man, them dudes, unreal. Hey, nice, man. So, for me, man, the expectations is, is it used to be, you know, we got to win every game, and I still want to do that. But now it's like, man, let's just get through each day negative tests because we get tested every day. 
So my expectations went from basketball, 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 just to be healthy on a daily basis. You know what I mean? And so, um, hey, once we take our test at eight, we get our results back at 10. Um, that's all I'm looking for. And anything after that, I saw icing on the cake. So I just want everybody to stay healthy and uh, have a good, prosperous year. That's a fact. That's a fact. Jay, man, I, I appreciate you coming on for real. It's, it's always love. And, and like I said, man, like you was a guy I looked up to. So, you know, to be able to have this, man, it's, it's special, man. And, uh, you know, nothing but the best um, for now in the new year. And I hope, you know, I hope we get to play, man. I hope, I hope we get to play some games because, like I said, I like seeing them twins play. They can rock. Yeah, man. I, and, and I hope so too, man. But also I want to tell you, man, I appreciate what you're doing. You make a noise off the court. And so you getting the support from the fans and, and the alumni up there because you're doing something positive. And I'm out here in LA, you know, I follow you on Twitter. So whatever you're doing, man, for the community, I, I support you, man. I salute to you. That's huge what you're doing because uh, you being selfless. You can easily just be like, man, I'm just going to do me, but you giving back. And um, Syracuse is a part of me too. So man, I, I feel what you're doing way out here in LA. You keep on doing your thing, man, and hopefully me and you will meet up somewhere soon um, and, and get to sit down and have a beer or something. Man, Jay, when you get that head coaching job, I'm ready for you, man. Hey, you go, baby. hey we, we, we ain't going to be in that cold, man. We're going to be somewhere on the West Coast if you can do that. Man, you talking to me right. Come on, man. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> appreciate all right, you. Man, we appreciate you, bro. I'll see you later. All right, Jay, love.